Good morning. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Um, you are here in a webinar titled Spain's Road to Recovery, a conversation with um, Manuel Muñiz. Uh, Manuel Muñiz is indeed here. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome him back to the American Enterprise Institute. He is uh, Spain's Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, the uh, Secretario de Estado por la España Global, uh, and um, welcome, welcome back. Uh, today, uh, our conversation is going to, to cover a number of issues, uh, many of them related to the uh, COVID-19 crisis and Spain's recovery um, uh, from it. Uh, we'll also touch at a number of issues um, related to the transatlantic relationship, to Spain's foreign policy, um, to trade policy. Uh, and we'll, we'll probably near the end of the conversation talk briefly about, uh, about election security. But let's first uh, start out by bringing everyone uh, uh, up to speed. So um, last time we talked was, was last summer. Obviously, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has continued since. Um, here in the US, we've, we've basically been in a situation of relatively similar lockdown measures throughout the period. Uh, that's, that's certainly not the case, I believe, in, in Spain. And so perhaps to, to give people some context, Maybe you can maybe you can talk to us about how the pandemic has evolved over the past, uh, you know, almost a year by now. What lockdown? What kind of lockdown measures Spain has engaged in? Uh, what what direct impact those measures have had on the economy? Uh, and then we can we can take it from there. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Well, thank you, Stan, and thank you to the institute for the uh, for the invitation. It's great to be back. Um, I mean, I can barely believe it's only been six months because it's been such a such a, an intense year that it, it feels like a much longer time. But we did we did meet in the summer, and uh, and we went over how things were here in Europe. The lockdown in in Spain has gone through various phases. Uh, I think by the time we were meeting, we had uh, we had already. Uh, left behind us the, the first wave of the pandemic, which was by far the toughest that Spain has seen, both in terms of numbers and uh, uh, the mortality of the disease. This, as you know, Spain was one of the first countries to be hit by this seriously you know, in March and, and April. Um, and by the time we met uh, in the early summer, we had the attack rate and uh, just the uh, the incidence of the disease had gone down quite significantly. In mid-June, uh, end of June, we arrived at an agreement within the EU to reopen our borders and uh, restore uh, mobility within the Schengen space, within the EU Schengen space. And that was felt all the way through the summer until about mid-August when that uh, collapsed and new measures started being imposed because we slowly entered uh, the second wave of the, of the pandemic, the second uh, pandemic curve. Uh, that was ended right before Christmas. Restrictions were softened again and then slightly, although we entered Christmas with very fairly strict rules trying to, precisely to prevent that Christmas became a huge accelerator of this. Uh, but despite that, and quite probably the impact of some of the new var uh, variants, although we're, we're still uh, trying to assess the full impact of these, uh, the numbers both in Spain and in other European countries have been going up. And I mean, I'm not, not to go into the details too much, but I'm very happy to, to do that. But uh, the Spanish economy is particularly vulnerable to some of the manifestations of this pandemic. So both, of them, both in terms of the impact on mobility, we have a huge uh, tourism sector, for example. Uh, Spain is the main beneficiary of Erasmus uh, scholarship uh, 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 holders. So these are students from other European countries that have come here to study, to do part of their undergrad studies here. Uh, we are by far the most popular destination in Europe. We have a huge uh, convention and conference uh, sector. I mean, you know, so the mobility economy is very big for us. And I am, in fact, a the... former Erasmus student in Spain, you know, uh, is that... as an example. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, that's right, and the the well, it's 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 over a hundred thousand people a year now, and and it's it's a very large program, but it also affects other sectors that are very important. Uh, fundamentally, for example, it's uh, the automotive uh, and the car uh, industry has taken a big hit, and Spain is a big one of the biggest producers in Europe of of uh, cars, for example. So overall, the hit has been significant. But let me let me just draw. Let me just say three very quick things. But the 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 situation is now evolving. Uh, even though we're in the midst of the third wave now, and it's very and it's serious, it's very serious in Spain, uh, just as it has been in Germany and in the UK and in other places, but it's reaching Spain now. 
uh, even, even, even though we're still struggling with that, there are three things that I think can lead us to be optimistic about what's to come. Um, and it's tough being optimistic no, uh, this, uh, this time. But uh, the first is the vaccination campaign, which is going, is going well. Um, it took us a while to reach the full speed of deployment of the campaign in this part of the world, but it's now, it's now moving forward. And the, the goal is to have 70% uh, of the population vaccinated by the summer, which is you know, a very significant number. Uh, and then the rest in the in the fall and the end of the year. Uh, this is the second good news is we passed a national budget uh, some uh, weeks ago. Uh, you know, and this is a little bit like in the U.S. is cause for celebration because because it took us a while to get a budget passed. We we couldn't get the we couldn't get the political uh, majority to get this passed for the past couple of years. In fact, we have we were on a deferred budget for about two years and a bit. Uh, and that gives us economic and financial stability and political, in fact, the stability for the foreseeable future. Uh, and the third is the European Recovery Fund, um, which was finally approved and all the details were settled. And uh, it basically doubles the financial resources of the EU. And Spain is one of the biggest beneficiaries of this. It, it is expected that Spain will receive about 140 billion euros in both direct transfers and soft loans from the EU budget. Uh, from the EU, and uh, and that's you know in scale, uh, it's unprecedented. I mean, when when Spain was the main beneficiary of EU funds uh, of the whole EU, it was receiving about you know seven billion net a year. Uh, we are expected to get just in grants, just in direct uh, transfers, uh, upwards of seventy billion in the next three years, right? So I mean, it's an or I mean, it's it, in terms of scale, it's, it's very significant. Uh, so we have a huge opportunity and the, the, the government is forecasting fairly robust uh, growth this year, much, much higher growth, in fact, than the average of the Eurozone uh, for this year and for the next, um, which is, I think, a consequence of the scale of the injection of funds that we're going to see and also a consequence of the correction of the declining growth that we saw because we saw a much steeper slow in growth here than in some other places in the EU. But, but overall, the picture looks as if, if we manage to control the uncertainty produced by COVID through the vaccination campaign and the mitigation efforts that we're doing, uh, then, then this year uh, would put us on, the, on a very solid path to recovery. So sorry, I think I took too long, but that was- No, the, the, this is great, uh, but I'm gonna follow up on some of these, uh, on some of these items uh, throughout the conversation. So first I wanted to, to ask you, um, you, you, you talked about the vaccination campaign um, and how it's, uh, you know, how deployments are, 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 are being made. Over the past few days, there's been a lot of reporting on uh, a, what, what looks like a conflict between the European Union and AstraZeneca over, uh, over vaccine purchases, over vaccine effectiveness. Um, there, there was confusing reporting out of Germany about the effectiveness of the, of the vaccine. Uh, can you can you speak to that? And I think more generally a bit, but how the uh, union cooperates with the member states in uh, securing the vaccine and deploying it. Obviously, there are parallels with the U.S. Here, the federal government has made significant purchases and then sends vaccines to the states, and that has all, that has also been, I think, a bit of a struggle. The coordination there, and then uh, th we've seen a lot of variation across states in how effective states have been in actually getting. Uh, uh, the vaccines to to people as opposed to just to warehouses in the states. Um, can you give us a, a, a bit of a sense of how that's been going in Europe, in Spain, and why we now see this quasi conflict with with AstraZeneca? Well, I, I mean, I'm I'm not sure if if um, issues like the one that has popped up with AstraZeneca were fully um, avoidable given the scale of what we're doing and how unprecedented it is. So. Uh, the EU is in conversations with AstraZeneca about this. In fact, I think they're meeting, I think, uh, tomorrow uh, formally to discuss the speed of the deployment because there's been a slight delay on, on some of the deliveries of the vaccine that, were, that are expected for uh, early next week and will probably be delayed by some time. But uh, the, the way that this has worked in Europe uh, and, and the reason why Europe is leading on the, on the dialogue with AstraZeneca is because we all agreed within the EU that we would function as a bloc and the EU would coordinate uh, the purchases of vaccines. 
we wouldn't compete with one another. We wouldn't be uncoordinated in the purchases. Uh, we would follow a very similar procedure of both the authorization of, the, of these vaccines, which is authorized by the European Medical Agency and then comes down to the national medical agencies for a double, for a double authorization. Um, and the EU would do these purchases on, uh, on mass, I mean, at scale. And EU member states would receive uh, their proportion of vaccines, a proportion which is equivalent to the proportion of the EU's population. So Spain is getting about 10% of the total purchases. Now the EU has managed to secure approximately 2 billion doses of the vaccine from different providers. So that's, I mean, that's about four times the number of vaccines that we're gonna need. So now the EU is collaborating with both uh, COVAX, uh, which is this global initiative to distribute vaccines globally, uh, you know, it, through the excess of purchases and also through the funding of the initiative in parallel. Uh, and it's also, and, and many of the member states are collaborating with Gavi, the Alliance of Vaccines and others. So there's a whole side of this process that will, that will be about distributing the vaccine to others. And, and we're very adamant about this and we feel strongly that this should be done. Uh, by we, I mean, I think both Spain and I think the totality of the EU as a matter of fact, because we're, we're very aware that unless we address this issue across the board, we're going to be exposed to the risk of import of the disease or to the risk of mutation of the disease somewhere else. I mean, it, it, this is a classical case, I think, of a public good uh, that we need to make sure that is well provided for across uh, across the board. So that that's how this has worked. So far, we're very, we're satisfied with, with how it was done. I, I cannot imagine how complex the process would have been with 27 purchasing programs, you know, in each of the, you know, one in each of the member states. I think we would have competed with one another for in terms of price and in terms of supply and in, and in, in all sorts of other ways. And I think it would have created a, a deep sense of inequality also in terms of access to the vaccine within Europe. And I think that would have been problematic. And, uh, and now I think it's been more, more efficient uh, in terms of cost. And also I think uh, another manifestation that Europe wants to address this collectively. So, so far so good. We'll see how the AstraZeneca negotiations go uh, in, the, in the coming days. So there's been some some skepticism here about the the pace of the rollout in Europe, and is that do you, is, is that just a, a, a the result of hiccups in the beginning in December? And do you think things are going reasonably smoothly now? So the, so there, there there are two dimensions here to the problem, right? One is the actual literally the actual deployment of these and, and vaccinating people on the ground. And this is very much up to the member states. I mean, in Spain, it came to Spain. We distributed it to the regions, uh, the equivalent of our states, because they're the ones that have the health uh, competence. So they, they, you know, they're the ones that run the health services locally. So they're the ones that are doing that. It took us a while to reach cruising speed on this because, uh, because it had never been done. I mean, we're, we're vaccinating hundreds of thousands of people a day, right? Um, and then there's a there's another issue, which is I think once we've reached this uh, right speed, and Spain I think has now, you know, we're using upwards of 90% of the vaccines we receive. So clearly now the issue is much more on the supply, uh, and the supply is it's a it's, it's a logistics and production issue. I mean, it's just getting these pharma companies uh, to ramp up their production and to make sure that they can deliver this to the states. And, and I think we we knew that there'd be a that there'll be a um, sort of like a long tail to the process of production and distribution of this, and it will speed up. Uh, but the goals that we have set of having all of, you know, that proportion of our population vaccinated by the summer, uh, we think it's doable. And we're working with, uh, you know, the EU is working with the providers so that we get the right numbers for that. I don't think the logistics on the ground at the member states, the actual, you know, the, the going to folks and getting them vaccinated, uh, will be a bottleneck to the process. I think I think um, it, it will be much more on speeding up their production by the by the pharma companies. So I'm gonna I'm gonna occasionally field questions from the audience throughout our conversation. We have one that's uh, that really fits in very nicely here, uh, both the vaccination and the tourism topic. Uh, Jim Lamont asks, what measurements will we use to determine that Spain is open for outside tourists to visit? Will they require the Spanish population to be vaccinated before opening the doors to tourism? Or will they open the doors, but only to visitors with proof of being vaccinated? Well, that's a very, that's a very, it's a, it's a pivotal question for us because, um, as I was saying, about about 14, 13, 14 percent of our GDP is dependent on tourism. Uh, about the same proportion of our employment. I mean, this is a, a really a key sector for us. So we've been we've been looking at this from the very beginning, from March. Now, the regime in Spain right now, the border, the border control, and the health measures at the border. Um, 
are fairly straightforward. Uh, we require PCRs to be done 72 hours before departure uh, from high-risk countries or high-risk regions within uh, Europe. This is basically uh, the regime. Uh, we, in terms of third countries like the US, and by third countries, I mean countries outside of the EU and Schengen, uh, what we are following is the consensus, the agreement that we've reached uh, within the Schengen area and the EU area. So all of us have decided that we will manage the external border, our relations with these third countries in the same way. And it makes sense, right? Because if we start admitting people from Brazil here in Spain and we have freedom of movement with France or Portugal, then we're breaching this uh, the cohesion of the external border. Uh, our external border is being managed in a fairly strict way. It's currently closed uh, for non-essential travel, and that includes tourism, uh, with I think upwards of 180 countries, because we've only opened to non-essential travel uh, to places that have a, 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 an attack rate of under uh, 16 per 100,000 over the last 14 days. So it's a straight, it's a strict uh, threshold. Uh, so we haven't had tourism uh, coming from these places for quite a while, because this has been in place. Uh, since the summer, uh, and and I, I don't think this is going to go away uh, anytime soon, particularly now with the, with the new variants. We've had more tourism coming in from EU countries, uh, as long as they're in the low risk category, or if they're in the high risk category, if they're willing to undergo PCRs before travel. But we're very aware that asking people, uh, tourists, to do a PCR is costly, is timely. In some places, they can't get it done within the 72 hour period and get the results. Uh, so it's, it de-incentivizes de uh, tourism uh, quite significantly. Now, let, let me just say a final word on the vaccination certificates and whether vaccination will be, uh, will be a means for people to travel. Um, this is a big debate in Europe now, and uh, we've, we've launched an initiative at the OECD, Spain has, uh, to try to build a common set of principles, either on testing or on the vaccination certificate, that we all abide by to restore mobility. So imagine we build a system where we ask either PCR at origin or before departure, or we ask for a vaccination certificate uh, before departure. We would then need to build a system of exchange of information so that we would be able to exchange information about this having been done, maybe through a QR code on your phone, or uh, th there are systems that are built to do this. And then we need a mutual recognition agreement across states so that we recognize mutually the validity of these tests or these vaccines having been uh, you know, uh, deployed. So, um, so we're working at the OECD to try to make this work. Initially, uh, the, the, the Spain's opinion about the vaccination certificates is positive. Uh, we want to study the possibility of then being an enabler of travel. I don't think we're still there in terms of a consensus uh, in Europe uh, or at the OECD. And I think it, it might take, uh, take us a little bit of time for this to become a really pressing issue, in fact, because, you know, I think it'll be in a month or two when a lot of people, you know, much larger numbers of people have been vaccinated, that this will become, I think, a, 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 real, a real driver for this. But we're looking into it, and our initial assessment is that it's, it's very much worth our time to be trying to build those, you know, information exchange systems and re mutual recognition uh, agreements, uh, maybe, maybe within the OECD framework for that, to be, for that to be something useful to restore mobility. And so do you, think, do, you, do you think Jim will be able to travel to Spain in June? Um, in June, possibly, yeah. Okay. In June, possibly, Good. yeah. yeah. Well, ultimately, we're just trying to <laughs> provide the, you know, a travel a travel agency service here. Um, so, but this is a good. The discussion of tourism is a good uh, uh, opportunity for us to pivot a bit to a discussion of the Spanish economy and measures uh, you guys have taken domestically and uh, the uh, new recovery fund that the European Union. Uh, has has set up that you you mentioned briefly before. Can you walk us through a bit the um, the support measures that that the Spanish government first has has taken through the crisis? So here in the U.S., uh, as as in as in all of Europe, the obviously the monetary policy was basically set as as loose as as. Uh, uh, people can currently imagine and that was accompanied by pretty dramatic fiscal support. Uh, quite a bit of it uh, focused at, uh, at 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 all households through stimulus checks. That's I think a very American uh, approach that Europe hasn't 
uh, hasn't followed. Um, but Europe is, but I think the U.S. has now also adopted a set of measures that are much more in line with existing European practices through the pay, the payroll protection program, which oh. basically you know provides support to companies in exchange for maintaining their their payroll. Uh, if 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 you if you could, could you talk about what Spain has done? To what extent do you think programs have worked well? Uh, when it, because there's two different purposes, I think, through these programs, right? One, you want to provide relief to families uh, so that they don't, you know, suffer unnecessarily throughout this economic crisis. On the other hand, you want to make sure you come out of the crisis with uh, your supply side intact, right? With companies still functioning, et cetera. And so can you, can you, can you talk about how, uh, you know, you've, you've, you've weighed up those two uh, dimensions of the crisis response, maybe with a good classical stimulus dimension to it as well, uh, what those programs have looked like, et cetera, to what extent you uh, feel like you're, you can assess how successful they've been, uh, those, those kinds of uh, yeah. issues. So, so there, I, I think there are two, there are two dimensions, there, there, there are two dimensions here. One is what we've done throughout the crisis to buffer, to buffer the economy from the shock of, of the pandemic. And then there's the more structural bit of what we're going to do moving forward, uh, particularly with the, with the EU recovery fund. So let me, let me look first at the, at the first bit. And by Excellent. the way, let me just say that both, both things are linked to EU policy and they're enabled by EU policy, the, both responses, both the short-term and also the longer-term one. Um, the short-term one, fundamentally, thanks to the uh, actions of the ECB, of the European Central Bank, that has, just like the Fed, uh, undertaken a very expansionary and very generous monetary policy measures uh, aimed at preventing this crisis from becoming basically a sovereign debt crisis. And it has given us, not just the ECB, but the ECB has been vital in this sense, uh, the, the maneuver, the budgetary uh, uh, margin to, to take very drastic measures. So Spain has undertaken, I think, if you look, in 2020 measures of upwards of 20% of GDP to sustain the economy. Now, what were those measures that were taken fundamentally too, and actually you, you outlined the, 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 the two main ones. One was on, the, on basically keeping the productive uh, ecosystem and our companies alive and, and preventing uh, liquidity problems from becoming solvency problems. And this was done through uh, credit schemes and credit guarantee schemes that were provided by the, by ECO, you know, fundamentally by ECO, which is our national uh, public bank uh, here in Spain. Uh, and then also a large amount of funding went into furlough schemes that were meant to uh, prevent uh, this temporary shock on activity trickling down to the destruction of, of employment. Of, uh, yeah, and so the furlough schemes are more in the spirit of revenue replacement as opposed to the uh, yes. you know, credit provision. Well, that the, yeah. It is, it is rev basically, it's, it's almost uh, like, uh, like uh, uh, it functions like that. And, and you know, we still have about 700,000 people uh, that are benefiting from these programs right now. It, it was in the millions. It was in the millions at the peak of the crisis. Are they heavily uh, concentrated in tourism? Well, they were, so they were, as you would imagine, they were very heavily concentrated on the sectors that were mostly affected by this. So a lot in retail, a lot in tourism, uh, a lot in, uh, you know, food and restaurants, uh, etc. Right now, I mean, just to give you a sense of how significant this was, I'm not sure if the figures will be relatable for an American, you know, for, for you guys, but we spent about 24 billion euros in these schemes in 2020. That's a, a roughly the number. Um, I mean, this is this is a large chunk of our of our budget uh, that went straight into these. And I think, by the way, there's something really telling about this. What? Is, how much is that as a share of GDP? I, I would say that's about um, that's about two percent. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, or a little bit more. Uh, but that's just, you know, straight into these programs to sustain uh, part of the cost of keeping these people in the payroll rather than rather than firing them. They're called ERTES here in Spain. Uh, there, as I was saying, there are about 700,000 people left in there. But if you look at specific sectors, so I was looking at the figures a few a couple of weeks ago. And if you look at the travel agency sector, well, about 60 percent of the employment in the sector is still under these uh, sort of mechanisms, right? So just to give you a sense how extraordinary this can be in terms of uh, sustaining uh, a sector that is hit uh, by this. And, and, and just, just a note on this, because I think it's very telling of how different the approach has been 
from the prior crisis, the 08, you know, 07, 08 crisis, where most of our uh, response was directed at keeping our financial sector alive and, 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 and running. And this time you look at this and a lot went to medium size, uh, small size enterprises, and it went to these employment schemes, to these furlough schemes. So, so I, I, I've wondered about this. And obviously, you know, we've seen a similar uh, developments in the US, right? Much more of the response now has gone to, uh, to, to small and medium sized businesses. So the original uh, uh, amount of PPP money in the CARES Act is pretty similar to that 2% of GDP that you uh, th th that you mentioned. Um, and obviously, in the there, after the financial crisis, much more of the focus was on rescuing the financial system, uh, uh, you know, and that triggered, I think, a lot of the, the sort of popular uh, disenchantment with the system was that so much of the support seemed to be going through those companies. So why, how do you explain that difference? Is it just the 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 nature of the crisis is very different is it that we've really learned as a society from our crisis response last time around and now we understand better how our economy works uh, or do you think it's just uh, that people have that people are worried that the you know uh, that people have learned from the political response to the previous crisis and that they they really saw that you know there's this upswing in popular sentiment uh, has really, you know, informed policymakers and made them decide, okay, we really need to go about these things differently. I, mean, I don't want to oversimplify, right? I mean, I, I'm sure there's sure. something, I'm sure there's something to the crisis uh, that asks for measures that are much more targeted at employment than in the prior crisis, right? I mean, there, there's something to this crisis that basically equates to getting your economy in the freezer and then taking it out. And you want to make sure that in the process, you destroy as little as your business, uh, you know, as your businesses as you can, and as little as your employment. So, so that so I think it's particularly it's a particularly attractive problem uh, for this set of solutions, right? Which is you you do this, but but to be honest with you, uh, I also think that there's something very structural here, which is uh, I think we learned that the exit to the 0809 crisis was very unequal. Um, uh, a lot of the cost was felt. Uh, by middle class families through through a number of mechanisms uh, through their savings through their uh, holding of real estate uh, assets through you know uh, it, through the destruction of employment in many instances uh, and that this couldn't happen again and uh, and I'll give you an example so so we had this lens almost from the get go of this crisis we had this lens that we had to be very careful with the distributive impact with the you know with the equity impact of the measures that were taken both in the healthcare management piece and also in the economics. So in the healthcare, for example, we, 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 we took the private healthcare providers and the public ones, and we, we, we forced them to work together. We basically said all of the private resources are going to be utilized by, by the public healthcare system in the management of the pandemic. Our vaccination campaign is fully public, it's free and it's universal. And th there's, a, there's a reason for these things, right? I mean, it, it's not just that it's more effective and efficient. I mean, there's a reason you, you, I think the last thing you want is to exit this crisis in which you can literally assess the cost of this in terms of lives of people having been lost. Uh, you don't wanna exit this with people feeling that there were big, big differences in terms of access or care uh, or attention on the part of the, of the government to their needs uh, because of their income or where they live, et cetera, right? But, but I'll give you a, a very quick note, but it, it was very telling for me. So we, Spain has chaired, chaired the OECD last year. We were the chairs of the ministerial meeting. Um, and as such, we, we convened a meeting of, uh, of TUAC and BIAC, which is the global uh, business uh, organization and the global labor organization, together with the member states of the OECD, to discuss the content of the statement and the, the, you know, the proceedings of the, of the ministerial. And, and I was amazed, you know, because throughout the whole process, you could see that there's a, there's a clear consensus that, uh, that we need to have more inclusive economies moving forward. And that this needs to be shown in the way we respond to the crisis. And, and this consensus that we should leave this crisis investing in digital, in productivity and competitiveness through digital, you know, so capacity building and, and infrastructure and entrepreneurship and all these things, and also in green and sustainability uh, and, and in, in equity, right? In, 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 in having this new social contract being built. And this is now, I think this is now believed by almost everybody. I mean, it's like, I can sense, the, the question is how you do this, of course, and the devil is in the details, but I, it feels very different from 08, 09, 
when we had this 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 uh, sort of I don't want to call it dogma, but where we had this consensus that that austerity was what was needed and that the crisis was a consequence of of irresponsible fiscal policies of the past, right? Um, so, so I, I think it's very different, and I think that it, almost for sure, a part of the nature of the response has been conditioned by the fact that we were looking at the problem through this lens. Uh, all of us, I think. Um, but I don't know. You tell me, Stan, how you how you see that. But I, I you know, in the U.S., I, I think the response. And now you're and now you're discussing this huge uh, stimulus package on top of the ones that have been approved. I mean, we're sort of breaking records all over the world. There's a whole debate about whether about how sustainable public debt will be, which I think will be an issue that we're going to have to deal with is the debt overhang of all of this, the public debt overhang. Uh, but for the time being, we're being able to finance uh, all of this um, uh, without major issues. I mean, Spain yep. has had no no problem funding this. But 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 anyway, so, so that, that and so that's, uh, and no, but this is this also this is reflected, I think, to some extent in the in the European response too, right, where uh, we, you know, there's now there's a recovery fund. The the uh, deficit rules were were waived, and I think for the foreseeable future, without really much discussion at all, um, the recovery fund itself, I think, was obviously a little more contentious, uh, uh, but ultimately uh, came, has come into into being. And so maybe uh, that that's a good next uh, uh, topic of discussion. And you know, we and you're right, right? We've seen the same thing in the U.S. Some of these massive uh, relief packages passed with overwhelming bipartisan support uh, last mm -hmm. summer. Um, you know, I, you know that, the situation is a little different now, but uh, I think the the economic situation is also a little different from the way it was uh, uh, last year. So, uh, to the to the European uh, Recovery Fund, can you can you talk about that? Why you think it's important? Uh, what Spain is going to do with the money it's going to receive? Uh, to to what extent do you see this as the beginning of a permanent? Uh, European fiscal capacity, et cetera? Um, well, I, I, I wouldn't want to tell uh, the truth to a Dutchman about this, but I, uh, it, uh, it, might, uh, it might be more permanent than we think. No, the, 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 on the, so actually, this gives me the chance to complete the other question that you asked, because I mentioned the ECB and the short-term measures. The long-term measures are all linked to the recovery fund. I mean, the, in essence, uh, the budgetary margin that we have uh, across most EU member states is almost a direct consequence of that of that fund being created and, and allowing us to direct it to specific things. Now, it's very large in scale. It's about 750 billion euros in total. Out of those, 140 are coming here. I think Italy is the only country that will be uh, getting more funding than Spain out of these uh, out of the EU Next Generation package, which is the name it has. I think it's very significant for three reasons. One because it sets a precedent that the EU believes that it has a duty to respond to these shocks in a coordinated fashion. And that's, you know, I mean, we could have concluded something different, right? That each country would have to fight this uh, on its own. The second thing that is relevant is that, as you know, uh, a part of it will be funded through the issuance of, of uh, debt with joint guarantees across member states. And that is new. And uh, there's, a, there's a pooling of risk uh, of sovereign risk uh, in that. And then the third thing is that there are transfers uh, involved. I mean, there, there, there's a large chunk of this that will be direct grants. So there are many taboos and issues that have been broken and that this fund sort of uh, uh, leaves behind. And I think to, is, to, give our, to give our audience a sense of the size, right? So 750 billion is about 6% of EU GDP, which uh, is a, a ton, especially in light of the usual size of the EU budget, which is about 1% of of, of EU GDP, right? And so this, I think that context is important because it's very different, of course, from the from the US context where the federal government has massive fiscal capacity and does a ton of spending, right? Here, it's, 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 it's really uh, almost an order of magnitude more than with the EU usually. Yeah, I mean, that's why I was I was saying, I mean, no, no, no one can compete with the US when it comes to fiscal stimulus, but the, but for Europe, this is, uh, this is very significant. I mean, it almost, it almost doubles the multi-year financial framework of the EU, which is a five-year long budget. And this, this is sort of almost doubles the total scale of that. Um, now, for, for Spain, this is very significant. It will, come, it will come into our budget. This is the way that this is being constructed. It will go into the national budget. And then Spain has produced a recovery and resilience plan, which is called España Puede. And, and it, it is a roadmap for the usage, for the use of these, uh, of these funds. And basically what we're, what we're doing there, there, there are a number of key areas, but one is digital 
which will get about a third of the funding. And, and, and there's all sorts of projects in there from education and human capital development to infrastructure, to investing in particular sectors, to supporting the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem in Spain. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a whole range of initiatives within that uh, overarching header. Uh, about a third, a little bit over a third will go into uh, ecological transition or the green economy. And there are issues there linked to uh, investments in renewable energy, building efficiency, um, uh, storage of renewable energy, particularly hydrogen and a couple of other. I mean, th there's, a, again, a whole bucket of projects that are there. And then we have uh, two other areas. One is on um, one is on regional distribution of this. Uh, so regional cohesion, because we're, we're quite concerned in Spain, not just in Spain, uh, about, about how economic opportunity and growth has been concentrating in very particular geographic areas. And this is producing something which is called here the emptied Spain, which is this idea of our, of our hinterlands, our provinces being de depopulated and deprived of uh, economic opportunity. And, and we want to, at the very least, mediate that process and make sure that we're doing all we can to build clusters and, and areas of activity in some of these places. Uh, and there's another whole line of work uh, linked to gender and equity uh, that will look at trying to increase uh, gender equality and equal, equal opportunity uh, across, uh, across genders in Spain. And so are these priorities set at the, at the European level? Because some of the, some element, some of the, uh, the areas of focus here don't sound to me like something the Polish or Hungarian government would necessarily emphasize. Is that, so is this coordinated or do you just, you just get the money and then you decide what to do with it? No, no. They, they, so, mm. so um, we were very fortunate, I think, here because uh, the way the priorities that had been set by the Spanish government almost from its from the get go, I mean, about a year ago, the current the current government were very aligned with the priorities that Europe had set for itself. So we have a we have a, we have a, a four uh, deputy PMs in Spain, which is an oddity, but it's a coalition government. So there's four of them. Uh, but if you look at the portfolios that they run. Uh, one of them is on economic affairs and digitalization, so digital. Uh, another is on energy and ecological transition, so the green economy. And another is on the Agenda 2030, so it's all, all of this idea of inclusion, cohesion, etc. Uh, the fourth is actually on on on, uh, on relationship with our with Parliament and on domestic policy. policy. But the, but the three that are substantive. Uh, on, on, uh, and that have a, an impact on economic policy already were tilted in that direction. What, what is still unclear is what the, the total conditionality on the funds will be. Uh, uh, that's a different story, right? One is on the priorities of expenditure, but the other is what structural reforms will accompany uh, the request for these funds. And then there, for, for Spain, there are questions about our pension system and there are questions about uh, um, our labor market and how it functions and there are questions about this and that. But that's a, it's an ongoing conversation with Brussels. Uh, and to be honest, we do not foresee uh, major, uh, major trouble in, you know, we don't foresee the conditionality being a, a, a blocking element to the right and early deployment of the funds. Because that's just a final line on this. Because uh, this is important, I think the the challenge of 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 the of the fund is that we de we front load the deployment because we need it we need it early on, uh, so we need to do this quickly in the next year or two ideally, uh, and also the other challenge is that it will have to go to all of these frontier sectors, uh, and this is different from prior cohesion and convergence funds from Europe that would go into infrastructure, you know, motorways and and airports and ports. This is this has to go to the knowledge and digital economy and others. So that that's you know that, that's part of the challenge. And so, do you see to what extent do you see a tension between the sort of economic relief slash recovery uh, objectives that you you have uh, that I think to some extent just involve much more traditional you know fiscal policy versus the more you know industrial policy or or, or climate uh, goals that come with this money? Do you? How, how do you think about balancing those two aspects? Um, well, I, I'm not sure if there's a dichotomy. I mean, in the sense that if you if you actually look at how this is going to be, uh, this is going to function operationally, it this is going to look like an injection into the national budget. So at the end, it's going to look like expansive fiscal policy, which in fact, which in fact it already is looking like. Because if you we the budget that I just mentioned before, the national budget that we approved, it's a very expansionary budget. Uh, I mean, there's a huge increase in the budget size, 
uh, it's a two digit, two, two digit increase. But the, the reason why that's the case is because we're already anticipating how EU funding will impact uh, you know, it's, it's expenditure. So this will go to the relevant ministries or to our regions, depending on who has the capacity to execute some of these projects. And it will trickle down through projects of various kinds, you know, building an infrastructure here, uh, launching this bidding process for this large, large contract somewhere else, refurbishing public buildings somewhere else. So for the foreign ministry, just to give you an idea of how this looks, even though the foreign ministry is not a huge uh, sort of, you know, spending, spending, uh, we don't spend as much as other ministries, right? Uh, we have two large projects. One is on the digitalization of the foreign service, um, which will mean that we're going to try to digitalize fully the consular uh, activities of the ministry, uh, plus our uh, part of our telecommunications will be revamped uh, infrastructure, plus our Instituto Cervantes, which is our, you know, our, our language institute around the world will digitalize a large part of its activities. So that's a classic case. No, it's, it's within one of the priority line items of the EU funds. It will come straight into the national budget. It has resulted in an increase of 20 odd percent in the foreign ministry's national budget uh, budget for next year. Uh, I, see. Yeah. I see. Well, good. For me, the, for me, the 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 management of the foreign ministry uh, as an organization is a good uh, jump off for us to go to uh, the next block of topics on uh, of foreign policy. Of course, uh, the U.S. now has a new president. Took some effort, but you know he's he's there. Um, and I believe that you just presented a a new um, sort of long term uh, foreign policy. Uh, strategy. Uh, can we can we talk first about how how that long term strategy is going to affect the transatlantic relationship? What what expectations you have, or what you've already seen of the uh, of the new administration? Um, what do you think the the prospects are for you know productive U.S. Spain EU U.S. cooperation uh, on a, on on the the range of issues. Uh, where where interests are shared or or in conflict. So so um, I'm going to try to be a, a little bit structured. No, in in the sense of why you know wh where do we think the world is headed? Um, so is why is this is this a challenge for us as a Spain? And where does the U.S. fit in that picture? Right? And and where does a Biden administration fit? And does it fit any better into that picture uh, than the prior administration? Right? And and is it is it is it going to be uh, quite possibly a more constructive interlocutor on a, on a range of, of issues. So where, where we see the world headed, and this is where our external action strategy begins, is, you know, if we had to define the defining feature of the last 20 years, we would say in international affairs, it would be this erosion, weakening of the international architecture, right? People in the IR field have called this sort of the collapse of the international liberal order from multilateralism to the rules-based order, um, you know, to international trade, to processes of regional integration. I mean, sort of liberalism in this broad term uh, being challenged globally. I, I think there's a domestic dimension to this, by the way. I think there's a real implosion of the order from within in many, in many of our countries and, uh, and that there's this rising illiberalism within our countries. But it's the convergence of these forces that has produced uh, some of the most defining features of the last 10 years and, and, and a real questioning about the sustainability of the architecture, of, of central pieces of this architecture, from the WTO to the WHO to the EU, you know, and I mean, we just lost uh, a member of the EU for the first time since the founding of the EU, right? We had only been gaining members since the, since the 50s uh, of, of, uh, of last century. Um, so, you know, we consider this from Spain to be something negative for us. We are a democratic, open, diverse, cosmopolitan, extremely economically integrated country with other places around the world. So we would much rather see a rules-based system that is multilateral, that has porous borders and people can move in and out, that has exchange of ideas. You know, I mean, that, that's the world we want to see. Uh, and this is what our external action strategy then does is it, it, it builds the totality of our action internationally around the goal of sustaining and fixing the, the, the sustainability issues within that order. So, we, so we, we have four axes of action. One is on human rights, democracy. So the promotion of human rights, democracy, the rights of minorities, the rights of women um, in particular. We have another axis of action on 
promoting a, a well-integrated global economy, but that is also just and fair. We speak of a new social contract in that section. We also want to see a much more sustainable from an environmental perspective uh, uh, world. And then finally, we're, we're going to be highly supportive of regional integration processes like Europe, where European uh, federalists, in fact, uh, and a stronger multilateralism. Now, to, to your question, right, and, and sorry for this big sort of, you know, di that diagnosis, but it, I think it's it's important. Now, where does a Biden administration fit? Well, it's good to see you put your IR doctorate to, to work, you know? It's, uh... <laughs> Absolutely. It has to be, it has to be worth something. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, so, so, you know, but, but you know, now to the, to the politics, right? So, so where does the, where does a Biden administration fit? Well, you know, on a very preliminary assessment, it fits better into that scheme for, for a whole range of reasons, right? It seems to be much more multilateralist. It's returning to the Paris Accord, which is very important for us. It's returning to the WHO, which we think it's important. We need to strengthen and reform the WHO, not abandon the WHO, which is, you know, a consequence of, the, of what we were discussing before, right? Which is this idea that uh, health is a global public good. We would want to see the US engaging with us on our conversation about the future of the WTO, uh, you know, uh, renewing its appellate body and getting the organization to work again uh, and maybe tweaking elements of the organization if it's needed. But, you know, I, we would rather see a strong international architecture rather than the dismantling of that architecture. Uh, do you think so that's going to do you think that's going to work? The, it's been a struggle and that, that that's an issue that predates the Trump administration. It does. It does. But uh, but I, I well, I, we we sh we sure hope it does, uh, and and we're not alone on this, as you know. And in fact, we talked about this in the in our last call in the summer. You know that uh, uh, all other member states of the WTO have found a way uh, to settle their disputes uh, in a in a rep you know in a replicated mechanism because we couldn't get the main uh, structure of governance to be renewed uh, due to the U.S. blockage of the appointment of the appellate body uh, judges. Right. So so I think I think that. That, that there has to be space for us to talk uh, about these things. Also on digital and digital regulation. I mean, if I, if I had to make a prediction about one of the topics that will be central to the transatlantic agenda will be everything that is uh, linked to the regulation of the tech space, uh, including digital taxation, uh, where I, I, I really hope we, get a, we reach an agreement at the OECD to, to regulate that. So, you know, the, present, pre the, the incoming president has been speaking about a lot, an alliance of democracies which also sounds well, uh, you know, to us, because, you know, if you buy the diagnosis that the world has been becoming more, you know, less democratic over time, uh, then as democracies, we should probably find ways to collaborate to make sure that. I think for. Uh, sorry, Stan. I, yes. Sorry, I think our connection. Yeah, I uh, think it was. was I think it was. It was my bad. But I. But I, I was finished. I said that on, on the whole, we were optimistic about what we can build together. Excellent. So the, the there is, I think, a bit of a tension between, uh, you know, some of the multilateral initiative and the openness to you know to working with everyone and porous borders and and global trade versus the internal situation in in countries. Uh, like China, maybe like Iran, like Venezuela. How, how, but, but let's focus in particular on China because it's obviously it's you, can, you can't really look at the Alliance for Democracies and talk about that type of initiative without thinking about it as being created in opposition to, to China. Now, I think many people here would say, look, the EU is trying to position itself sort of in between the US and China, right? Not as uh, a part of a, a block of... It, of uh, you know, it not not it doesn't want to be part of a new Cold War in a sense, and so I do think there is a bit of a tension between, you know, continuing engagement with with China on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, a an international uh, a, a foreign policy based around the values of liberal democracy and human rights. Right? And so how 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 do you grapple with with that tension, and where where wh what role does Spain see for itself there? Um, we don't see um, we don't see our position uh, between China and the U.S. as equidistant. I think it'd be a mistake to see it in those terms. I think we share with the U.S. a very broad 
very broad catalog of shared values and shared interests. I, I'm of the opinion that there's an Atlantic um, civilization. I mean, we, we share political model, we share the same appreciation for, for freedom and for democracy and very important elements of that, including freedom of speech and of uh, political participation and of the, the, the media and of the press. And I mean, uh, uh, you know, this is reflected in how we view uh, to some extent, uh, we have much closer views uh, about how technology should be regulated, about how privacy should be regulated. Um, so I don't, I don't think, uh, and by the way, if you look at the economics uh, still, uh, that, that's even the case also regarding the economics. But even if it wasn't, I think the first argument is strong enough uh, for us to realize that we are an Atlantic uh, country and, and uh, we are an Atlanticist country in terms of foreign policy. Now, uh, our, our take regarding relations with China is that it, uh, it, we should build a relationship on three principles. One is that the relationship should be strategic, so it should be long-term, and we should probably build it at the EU level on many, many issues. So Spain is, um, is very supportive of an EU stance uh, towards China on a whole range of issues. We think that it should be uh, systemic, so it, we should engage with China on the issues where China is fundamental to global governance. So say climate change, regulating, uh, you know, um, capital flows, uh, you know, some issues linked to trade, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, some issues linked to development, you know, China is a very important actor in our Southern neighborhood, for example, in parts of Africa, uh, but it should also have a component of, uh, of rivalry, right? And, and the EU has now defined China as a systemic rival and this is both true in the economic uh, sense of the word, and it's also true on the political model uh, sense of the word, uh, of the term. And, um, and I think that that needs to be very present. And, and I think we need to be very honest with the Chinese, our Chinese interlocutors, that that's the case, uh, and that we would much rather see people have political rights in China and in many places within China, and that we would rather see the media be free and that we would rather see people's privacy not be impinged upon and used in various ways. So I, I think that has to be a part of the agenda. Um, I think that the incoming Biden administration will, will want to bring uh, its allies on board regarding China in a much more intense way than the prior administration. And I think that that's a good, that's a good way to go about it. So um, yeah, that's, that's where we stand on that, on that topic. Excellent. I have, we have about three more minutes. And so I'm going to ask you a quick question about two uh, uh, core Spanish foreign policy topics. Uh, one, what do you think of the deal uh, Spain has reached with the UK over Gibraltar now that the, the UK is leaving the EU. And then secondly, what do you make of the um, uh, n new US support for Moroccan control over the uh, Western mm -hmm. Sahara? Okay. It's all, it's all easy topics. I, I see. Exactly. I'm, that's why I'm giving you three minutes. So you can. The, the, uh, so on Gibraltar, I mean, I'm not sure how, how aware people are of this, but it's a long standing disagreement with the UK over the sovereignty. Uh, over Gibraltar, which is this piece of, of land in, in, in the south of the, of the peninsula. Um, it was a very strategic piece of land at the time when, when it was lost by Spain, um, because it's right on the Straits of Gibraltar and, uh, you know, it had a military base on it, etc. Uh, we, uh, we haven't managed to reach an agreement on how to resolve this uh, structurally between the, the two countries for a very long time, but we managed to reach a very effective an operational agreement about what will happen to the citizens of Gibraltar and to the citizens of Spain that work in Gibraltar and vice versa after Brexit. Because once they leave the EU, the external border of the EU will be the border between Spain and Gibraltar. And that means that about over 10,000 people that go in and out of Gibraltar every day to work would have been extremely, you know, seriously affected by this. Uh, you know, possibly losing their right to work, having to uh, having to be subjected to these border controls uh, there. So what we've agreed is that the border between Spain and Gibraltar would be fully lifted, uh, but there will be border checks, Schengen, EU border checks, done at the port and at the airport of Gibraltar. Now, what's interesting about this 
is that it's a it's a it's a it's an agreement that is built on the notion of interdependence, right? It's not an agreement that is built on this notion of you know on our on our dispute about sovereignty over the over the land. We've we've parked this discussion. Both of us retain that claim, uh, both countries, but we've come to an agreement that recognizes that we're strongly interdependent, and we would much rather have this agreement than no agreement at all. Uh, on Morocco, I'm going to be very brief because uh, all we have is a tweet from the outgoing U.S. president about this um, <clears throat> that changes a long-standing position of the uh, of the U.S. about this issue. Uh, that runs uh, that that to some extent uh, is not consistent, is not aligned with UN resolutions about the Western Sahara and its uh, and its status. And Spain's position has always been that we should double down on our efforts on the Secretary Generals of the UN uh, work in the region, particularly uh, MINURSO, which is the mission that is deployed uh, there, and that an agreement should be reached within a UN framework about the status of the Western Sahara. So we, we think that uh, the stance taken by the US, uh, although I think it's well-intentioned in the sense that it, it was meant to ease relations between Morocco and Israel, which is always, I think, something positive, and we've supported the effort of that uh, of that taking place in all of the instances that it has, in the UAE and you know and, and the others. Um, but in this case, we think that the matter leaves the substance uh, of the conflict unresolved, uh, and we're of the opinion that this still needs to be managed uh, through the UN and through MINUSO. Uh, so that's that, that, that's our take on that topic. But I'm very curious to see what the new U.S. administration does regarding that. Me too. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much. I will uh, I will let you go now. I won't corner you with the last question that I will give you 45 seconds for. Um, sure. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you all for uh, watching and um, and good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thank you.